All right, make your way back to your seats. Make your way back to your seats. Okay, I don't know if you can share. Don't be sharing your recipes, okay? Those are like family secrets, right? (laughs) Family secrets. Yeah. Let me pray, and we'll dismiss the kids. Um, God, thank you for this rainy day. Thank you for how you're guiding and directing us. Thank you for this church. Thanks for your Holy Spirit at work right now. Holy Spirit, come. Show us, teach us, minister to us. Will we see your kingdom in a brand new way? Be with the kids, teach them truths that would be with them for the rest of their lives. Thank you for Linda and for Jess and for teaching these amazing kids this Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so kids, you can go with Jess and Linda. They're your teachers this Sunday. Have fun. So I wrote something for Father's Day, and um, it's a little like liturgy. And um, our, our relationships with our fathers are complicated. For some of us, our father's love is like God's love, too deep, too long, too wide, too strong to measure. Some of our dads are here, but some were never here. For some of us, God's love fills in the empty spaces our fathers left behind. All of us are shaped by the relationship or lack of relationship with our father. On this day, we remember what it means to have a father or to be a father. We recognize the importance of fathers in our communities. We pledge as a church, as Live Free Church, to love and to nurture the fathers among us so they will manifest the love of God and all they do to the people around them. So we're going to pray this prayer. Pray with me. Loving God, you who are our Father, we thank you that you have shown us how important it is to follow your example as we grow in faith. Teach us to be obedient to your will, respecting you as children ought. We thank you for your mercy despite our disobedience. Strengthen us to stand up against the challenges of this world. Honoring your name and trusting your grace. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. I've been reflecting on, before we move into the sermon, I I read a book just this past year, and it said that everyone has a father wound that only the Heavenly Father can heal. And I'm pretty thankful for that. So whether or not this day is a great day for you, your Heavenly Father loves you. He knows you, and he's for you. I want you to know that. Do you ever wonder today in our culture, as we kind of shift in the sermon, um, what it looks like to have a kingdom? Have you ever thought about that? Like, we have a queen. One day we'll have a king. But what do you think about what it looks like to actually build a kingdom? Like, when you think about a kingdom, what does it look like? Is it, is it Warren Buffett? Is it Elon Musk? You see, in, in Father's Day, it says things like, you know, on, on Father's Day, you have to be the master of your domain, right? I have friends who say, well, this is my house, but actually in this one spot of my house, this is what I call my kingdom, the man cave. Maybe it's a garage, maybe it's um, a room, maybe it's a gaming spot. I have no idea, but I think for a lot of us, we are kingdom builders, whether we like it or not. That you build kingdoms whether you think you do or not. Maybe it's a car. Maybe it's your kids. We are great about building kingdoms. But in this passage in Mark chapter 12, verse 1 to 13, Jesus gives a kind of a story, a parable, an example of what the kingdom of God looks like. And what I'd like us to look at today is the contrast of two kingdoms. One is an earthly kingdom. One is a heavenly kingdom. One is, the second thing is, what does it look like to have a servant king? The third thing is, how are we created for that kingdom? So if you have Bibles in Mark chapter 12, verse 1, let's go there. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, but dug out a pit 
for a wine press and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and went away. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from them. They took him, beat him, sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another servant to them, and they hit him on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. Then he sent many others, some they beat, some they killed. He had one to send, a beloved son. Finally, he sent to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those ten farmers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? Will he come and kill the farmers and give the vineyard to others? Having read this scripture, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. They were looking for a way to arrest him, but feared the crowd because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they left him and went away. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to tra- trap him in his words. When, it came, when they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know you are truthful and don't know what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God's truthful, the way of God truthfully. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring a Daenerys to look at. They brought a coin. Whose image is inscripted on this? He asked them. Caesar's, they replied. Jesus told them, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Now, Mark does this amazing thing where he kind of jumps in these spots in his gospel, and he's trying to kind of hit home on certain points. And sometimes I think when you kind of step back in Mark's gospel, you see that in this passage, he kind of shows two kingdoms. He shows one that's Christ's kingdom, one that's Caesar's. One that's eternal, one that's earthly. You see, when you look at this, this parable, which I think sometimes people get so confused by parables, that the owner of the vineyard in the story is God, and the vineyard itself represents the people of Israel. But there's some details about the vineyard, about this parable, that are really critical, that when you kind of like gloss over them, the vineyard was given every equipment. They had everything they possibly needed. There was a wall to mark out the boundaries, to keep robbers out, to defend against the salts of wild boars, some commentary said. There was a, a wine vat, a wine press. There was a tower. In this tower, the wine was stored, but also the workers slept there. There was security and safety. The farmers here are the people of Israel. And the, the servants that the owner sent are prophets, and the son is Jesus. You see, this story, when Jesus explained it, was actually very common in Jesus' time. Because the country had so much unrest and so many absentee landlords that the owner would find someone who might be a Jew who wants to become a little more like prosperous, a little more comfortable, a little more land than which they had. The owners of the vineyards usually were Romans in that day. And if the owner followed the law, the first time for collecting the rental would be five years after planting. Like that's a while. Right? But it shows us some things about God in his kingdom. And this is what the parable is supposed to do. And when it shows us the generosity of God, it really does show us who he is in his character. The vineyard was fully equipped with everything that was necessary to make the work of the farmers easy and profitable. You see, God is generous in his life. That the fact that you're in a theater, the fact that you live in North America, the fact that you're driving in a car, the fact that you woke up in a home when my heat flicked on this morning because it's so cold <laughs> for June, I was reminded, God, you are generous to me. You see, God gave the workers, the farmers, fully equipped. They're, the whole farm was equipped. They had everything they needed to become profitable. 
You see, you have everything to the work that God's called you to do. He's a generous God. For some people, maybe it's just a conversation with a stranger at Starbucks. Maybe it's bringing a meal. Maybe it's showing up for someone. You see, God is so generous in our life that, that really we cannot stop being generous. We have to be generous. We have to look at our, our time, our talent, our treasure and say, God has given us everything we need. Even the moments we feel like we don't have enough. Because isn't that true of us? That sometimes the worst moment of our lives is the moment we get the thing we deeply have always wanted and it can't actually fill our heart. It can't satisfy me. I wish that Amazon, that order from Amazon could fulfill me. I wish it could give me some, some excitement, some like, oh, I feel now fulfilled. But the human heart's a vacuum. Whether it's a house or a vehicle or whether it's a possession or a relationship or family, no matter what it is, it's never enough. But God here in the story shows us how generous he is. They fully equip them with everything they need. The second thing it shows us is the trust of God. That the owner went away and left the farmer to run the vineyard by themselves. Isn't that remarkable? Like, isn't it hard just to like, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but to go on holidays and leave my house just empty? <laughs> and have someone like feed my cat? It's like, will they feed my cat? Will they look after my place? Will the toilet flood? You see, this owner goes away and leaves the farmers to run a whole vineyard. What he's saying here is, it's yours. Take the keys. I remember my mom when I was a kid, and she said, hey, here's the keys to the car. Don't do anything stupid. I remember my mom, she shares a story once where she's like, I'm about 17 years old, and she's walking down the road in Quinnell, and she's walking with my stepdad. And she goes, Colby is so responsible. He drives just so remarkably safe in my car. And she says, as I was saying that, you ripped around the corner on a gravel road as you're skating along, and they come straight and straighten out. Right? There's some trust there. But that God trusts us to do the work. He's entrusted us to plant a church in Kelowna. He's entrusted you with fulfilling the Great Commission, which is making disciples who make disciples. That's a remarkable thing. But really what it shows us is that there is absolute trust. Like, I wouldn't let alone, like, leave my house alone with a friend, let alone a farm. Like, a farm is a ton of work. You see, God trusts us to give us freedom in the life that we live. He gives you freedom. I've, I've heard freedom kind of explained this way before, where I think in our culture that we think freedom means no rules, no parameters, no boundaries. Right, like Danae went on a trip to Utah with some with Rena and some friends, and Danae says, "Can I bring my fish by your house?" Right? Imagine that little fish. And I said, "Hey, fish, you've been living not a free life. I'm going to take you out of that fish bowl. I'm going to throw you into the world to live your true and authentic and real life with no restraints. How insane is that?" She would come back and she'd be like, "Where's my fish?" I'm like, "I set it free." Danae, your fish is free. Like, don't worry about it. Brandon is free, living a full and true and better life. You see, isn't that what we do with our life? Is that God has given us the freedom, but he's given us parameters and boundaries. But we say, no, no, we don't need any boundaries. We need no parameters. You see, the first thing it shows us, the kingdom of God is generous. God is fully generous 
There's trust. The third thing is there's patience. I love this. Not once, but twice. Sorry, not once or twice, but many times. The owner gives the farmers a chance to pay the debt they owed. You see, he, he comes and he wants to correct Israel. He's bringing these prophets saying, hey, are you aware? Are you aware of what I'm doing? Can you see me yet? Can you see what I'm doing in your life? And they're not aware. And eventually he sends his own son, his beloved son. You see, we have a thing, a statement in our values. That's, we say that we want to be a church that reaches people at all costs. And someone said, at all costs? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I don't think it's at all costs. I don't think we should risk anything to reach anyone. And I was like, wow, like, when you think about how God was pursuing you for your whole life, since your first breath to your last breath, and he's sending people in your life to remind you who God is, the grace that you need, the people that you need, that matters. He wants to wake you up and maybe shake you up. One of my friends was reaching out to a friend, and his friend was really interested in Jesus. It's at a bar, and uh, his friend says, um, he's like, yeah, you know, like, he goes, I don't think God would ever forgive me for my sin. Like, I've done some pretty messed up stuff. My friend's sitting there, and he goes, oh, I just feel like there's just no way to convince him. But in our culture, there's just, we're so oppositional, right? So my friend goes, yeah, you know what? I think you're right. I don't think God could ever forgive you. And he goes, no, I think God could forgive me. You see, this guy was put in this weird spot in a bar, talking to his friend about Jesus. But see, it shows us the patience of God for us. How, God is, how patient is God for me and for you, for our friends who don't maybe follow Jesus yet? You see, how often are we praying, God, we might have given up on someone, but you never give up. That you always leave the 99 for the one. Do you always love and delight in prodigals coming home? The last thing it shows us the justice of God. You see, I think people take advantage of the patience of God sometimes, but no matter what, in the end, God gets the justice and the judgment. See, God may bear long with disobedience or rebellion, but in the end, He gets His justice. You see, that's the kingdom of God. It's generous. It's full of trust. It's patience. It's full of justice. But Jesus, when he moves that parable to the Pharisees and the Herodians asking about taxes because they want to trap him, really it shows us the complete oppositeness of God's kingdom. See, where there's generosity, there is just being, there's in, indebtedness in our world. You see, the coin had power. It was a sign of power. In the society, you owe a tax. You owe something to the society. See, in Jesus' culture, where he's speaking to this, there's three different taxes. You think we're taxed? They had three taxes. And I know we're all probably grumbling who own homes. It's like property taxes and all other things. I get it. But there was a, a ground tax, which was one-tenth of all grain or one-fifth of all wine. An income tax, which is 1% of each household, which I think that sounds not bad. But there was a poll tax, which was levied on all men from 14 to 65, and all women aged 12 to 65, and is one denarius. But see, the longer you live, the more you realize you owe something to someone. That you owe. And the religious leaders were saying this is unjust. They want a rebellion. 
They were saying, okay, God, if you're so generous, why are we paying these taxes to Caesar? Because it's exhausting. It's enough. Can you imagine if I just like sent my property taxes in with like just a passage like this? Like, actually, no, I'm part of God's kingdom now. Kelowna would be like, that's very cute. But see, these people, these Pharisees, Herodians, were saying, someone's taking our money and it's enough. I'm done with that. See, the earthly kingdom, there isn't trust, there's positional power. See, whoever's name or image is on the, is on the coin has positional power. Have you ever interacted with someone in positional power? Like, like I think about like a prime minister, he's in positional power. I remember one of my earlier jobs, um, I worked at Youth for Christ. And I remember I was a, I'm a skateboarder, and so I know skateboard stuff. And so this one guy was like my, he thought he was my boss, right? But we were kind of the same tier, I guess, or coworkers. And uh, one day the kids, like the students, were like, hey, actually, we don't want to set up all the ramps, so just set up all the rails to skateboard. I said, fine, let's do that. Well, this one guy came in, I'll never forget. And he came in, he looked around the gym, and he goes, where's all the ramps? I said, well, the ramps aren't set up. And he goes, well, we spent a lot of money on these ramps. I said, well, okay, I, I understand <laughs> that we have donors that bought the ramps. He goes, do you know how much money these ramps are co- these cost? And they're in the, co- in the closet in the back? I said, okay, yeah, yeah, I know. They're like $30,000, right? Because they all collapse, and they're all like, skate light and all these amazing things on them. And he goes, you know what? I'm telling you right now, I want you, I want you to set up the ramps. I was like, I'm not setting up the ramps. <laughs> right? And this is like, a, all of a sudden it's a battle. And he goes, I'm not telling you. I'm commanding you to set up the ramps. Right? Have you ever had something like that in positional power? Like, I was so mad. Oh, man, I was, I've never been like that. Remember I went up to upstairs, called my boss. I quit. Hung it up. He said, do not quit. And the guy, when he explained to me, my coworker, he said, positional power. He said, here's the deal. You know, our boss is up here in this ship pole. And I'm right here. And you're way down here. You see, our culture, John, John Maxwell says, leadership is influence. And what does that mean? It means relationship over time that builds trust. You see, in earthly kingdoms, there isn't trust. There's just positional power. People power tripping. That's why people, when they get to Tim Hortons or Starbucks and their order's slightly wrong, they're just like rageaholics because they just want some little bit of power and control in their world because maybe they don't have any. See, in the earthly kingdom, there isn't patience. It's immediate. See, if you're owed taxes, is not immediate? Pay me now. <laughs> the government of Canada, what's taking you so long? Pay me back some of my taxes on my tax return. But if you're owed taxes, you know, if you owe taxes, it's like, I'm going to wait till the last day to pay those. But the government's just breathing down your throat. You see, they wanted an earthly kingdom. But really what Jesus is trying to say here is that the earthly and the eternal kingdoms are so different. See, when Jesus says, give to Caesars what, give to Caesars what is Caesars, it means that your, our money, even today, has an image on it. That it belongs to the state and not us. We may hold it. We might steward it. But I want you to realize this, and this is what Jesus is trying to say here, is that you have a different image on you. The Bible says that you were created in the image of God, therefore you belong to God. What does it look to belong to God? Go back to that story, the parable, that God sent his beloved son so we can become the beloved. It shows us how hostile people are, are to the claims of Jesus. It shows that Jesus knew he was going to die and the cross wasn't a surprise to him. But it shows us how in Christ 
we can have generosity, trust, patience, justice. But so often we want more. We have to remind ourselves, I have to remind myself this week, that Jesus is the ultimate triumph. He was the one who was mistreated and killed for us so we wouldn't face rejection but connection to God. But see, here's the interesting thing about I think, the way we attach to God is that some of the commentators in this passage say that the farmers thought they could take the inheritance, that they could kill the son and enter into possession of the vineyard because they thought the owner was a far way off. You see, I was reading this book this past year, and an attachment to God really does matter. It really does matter. A.W. Tozer says, what we think about God is the most important thing about us. What you think about God matters immensely. Now, Carrie, who's a counselor here, will know more about these attachments, attachment theory. But attachment theory, all it's saying here is that we have attachments based from our childhood by the way we attach to each other and the way we attach to, to, to God actually affects all these things. Emma, do you want to pull this slide off, actually? Let's go to blank. There's kind of four ways, not three. And one is ambivalent attachment. If this is a person who thinks that others are trustworthy, but they're not. This author said that when you're looking for a relational pattern with God, these people tend to talk a lot. But there's no real relationship. You see, some people perceive these, this ambivalent attachment style as someone who's spiritually attuned and connected to God, but the real experience is so limited, it's more desperation than it is communion. Avoid attachment as someone who keeps, keeps at a distance even the closest relationship. There's a distrust built in, saying, well, maybe they will not meet my needs. Maybe they won't be there for me. Maybe they won't show up. And this person, which is my attachment style, <laughs> Is someone who feels like God's distant. Someone who feels like, man, God is way, way, way off. And when bad things happen, you're like, yeah, see, God is even here. Like, why would God let me go through this intense amount of pain and struggle? Or where was he when my life fell apart? Like, God, where are you? Scatter attachment says this, that people person pulls people in and pushes them away. This person experiences others with emotional intenseness and things kind of cool off quickly. This person's relationship with God is so similar. There's strong feelings of closeness and then profound feelings of long distance in a relationship. One of my friends explained this to me once. He said, you know, he's sitting in a coffee shop, and he goes, I just want to feel the Holy Spirit again. Because when I feel like I feel the Holy Spirit, I feel like my whole life is all right. Hot and cold. The last one is secure attachment. This person is able to rely on others and able to stand as an individual. But this author said, the pride of exaggerated reliance on one's own abilities leave little room for reliance on God. You see, what about you? Like, what do you think about when you think about God? See, Jesus told the Herodians and the Pharisees, as I kind of close this up, Les, if you want to come back up here. He told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. You see, take a coin out of your pocket. I don't have change on me. And you see, there's an image on that. But for you, you were designed for something so different, not an earthly kingdom. That's like if you go to a funeral, I often say at funerals, I'm like, this feels so unnatural because we were never meant to die. We were meant to live forever. You see, you're designed for a different kind of kingdom a whole different kind of kingdom, and your image doesn't look like something on a coin. It doesn't look like something you can buy 
or trade, it looks like Jesus. That you were created in God's image. That in Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross for you, you can become the beloved son or daughter. That you can have a heavenly father that fixes those father wounds that so many in this room have. You see, I want you to realize this. Is that today, when we give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, and that means you and me. That means our lives dedicated to Jesus in his kingdom, building something that's unseen. I had a friend of mine who years ago, I sent him down for coffee this past week. He says, I bought a bus years ago to drive kids around in Salmon Arm. And I said, can you imagine? Like it, he said, it was a crazy thing. People thought I was foolish. People thought I was reckless. People thought, how could you buy a bus? And he says, I saw students who need to hear Jesus. We drove them from Sycamus to Salmon Arm every week. I said, can you imagine 10,000 years from now? Where we're sitting with Jesus. And those kids heard Jesus, heard about Christ for the first time because you bought a stupid bus. A bus you lost money on. You see, would we understand that God's kingdom is so different than our kingdoms that we built? That it's full of generosity. It's full of trust. It's full of patience. And it's full of justice. Let's pray. God, show us the ways that we build our own kingdom. And will we see you at work building your kingdom in Kelowna as it is in heaven? Amen.